Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. Let's make a start. Let's make a start. Right, so we're going to do 1 Peter chapter 1 today. We're going to start on the first letter of Peter. So let's. Uh, let's have a prayer. Yeah. Okay. You are the lively today, Tony. Duffy, pleased to see us. Right, okay, let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus to ask that you open our eyes as we read the first of Peter. And as we hear, actually, not so much Peter's words, but you talking to us. And we pray that we might hear it and that we might understand and that we might be touched by your outreach into our lives. And that truly we might experience this new birth that is spoken about, that we might be able truly to have a, another chance in life and to start again. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> right, so what do you know about Peter? Well, Peter was uh, the guy, the brother, who baptized 3,000 people in one day in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And we're told that they were Jews, so he baptized. And then it seems he baptized another couple of thousand. And then there was persecution. And the Romans turned against Christianity and the Jews turned really nasty, persecuting anyone who'd left Judaism and become a Christian. And so the, the temple system chucked them out, the synagogues chucked them out. And in those days they didn't have social benefits, didn't have a benefit system, but <clears throat> the, the synagogue gave you basically your social support if you had a hard time, and especially the temple in Jerusalem. And if you were chucked out of that system because you'd become a Christian, you were left with no, as it were, benefits, no, no social support network. <clears throat> Plus, they were persecuting the Christians. <clears throat> and so, they, they scattered. They scattered all over the Middle East, and particularly many of them ended up in what we would call the south of Turkey. And as the years went by, of course, the faith and commitment of those people had been baptised, even though they'd suffered so much at the time, started to go down. And so Peter is writing to rev them up. So he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the chosen ones who are temporary dwellers of the dispersion or the exile in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's all places in what we would call the south of Turkey. So he says, look, you've been chosen. And that is always a comfort in hard times that actually I was chosen by God from the beginning. And you struggle, we all struggle with this whole thing about why, why was I chosen? Why was I born in an age where, and in a place where I could encounter Jesus Christ? Because billions of people have lived on this planet and never met him, never encountered him. And you think, why me? And you think, well, am I any better than anybody else? And of course, the idea of being chosen is that, no, you weren't. God didn't say, oh, I'm just going to choose the good ones. He chooses just like that. It's called sovereign choice. He, he simply chose us. And when Paul talks about that in Romans, he says that's an example of his grace, of his kindness, that he chose us, although it wasn't because we were, per se, better than anybody else. And that humbles you. It really does. And part of being a Christian is to be humbled. And in fact, Peter writes two letters, right? First of Peter and second of Peter. This first one, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. When you read the second of Peter, it begins in a similar way, but a bit differently. He says, Peter, a servant, a slave, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So as he goes on, he progressively becomes more humble. He realizes, I'm just a slave, I'm a servant, that's all I am. And you see it in Paul, you see it, I think, in the spiritual sort of growth pattern of everybody who's a true believer, that you become more humble. Now, of course, in the eyes of the world, humility is weakness, but that is not at all how God sees it. Humility is not weakness. Humility is simply not being proud and realizing more and more who I am, that I am nothing of myself, it is all of him. So he says, you are, you are just temporary dwellers, you're in exile. Yep. 
But actually, that is how it is for all of us. That, as Paul says again in Hebrews 11, that we're simply passing through. You may say, no, but I'm British, I'm this, I'm that, I live in London. I'm a British bloke who lives in London. Well, that's my identity. But actually, no, if you're in Christ, you belong to God's kingdom, to God's people. And by baptism into the Lord Jesus, we become part of the seed of Abraham. And that means that we become spiritual Jews. We are spiritual Israel. The old Israel, the natural Israel, rejected the Lord Jesus, but we have accepted him. And so we have a new identity. We are a, a chosen nation, as Peter is going to say. We are chosen by him to be a new people. And we think according to different principles. In this country, they talk about British values, whatever British values are supposed to be. Our values are totally different. That the true greatness is in humility. That the true wisdom is in being generous and not in in getting as much as I can on my stack and my pile or, or whatever. So again he says it in verse 2, you're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Again, this is an amazing idea that God knew, you and me, right from the beginning of the world. That nothing in our lives was chance. That the moment you were born was not chance. The parents you were born to, the, the society you grew up in, the situation you grew up in. All your experiences, none of this was random. And the worst thing is when you feel, I'm just lost. I'm just swimming on the, on the water with absolutely, just a, the, you know, I'm just a victim of random chance. There is no random in our lives. If you are with God, there is no chance. There is no good luck or bad luck. It is all absolutely of him. God foreknew it. So he says you're chosen according to this foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit. What does that mean? To sanctify means to make holy. So the idea is that when you're baptised in water, then the Spirit of God works in your life to sanctify you, to make you holy. Right? So the Lord says <clears throat> in John 3 that... You've got to be born, unless a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Now, you see, when you're baptized in water, that's why I encourage people to be baptized, then you have the Spirit working in your life with the aim of making you holy. And you see, you need that. We want that, but we are so weak and we don't have steel in our soul. We are weak as water. And yet, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we can be changed. And there's nothing more beautiful than actually seeing somebody get baptized, become into Christ. And as Paul says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. That in him, and through the work of his Spirit, we are made new people, a new creation. And we're no longer simply the product of of all the situations that happened to us in our lives, what we were born into, what we experienced, etc. We are formed in a different way, and we become a new person. So he says, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who according to his great mercy begat us to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he lives, as that song says that we play here, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And as he said, because I live, you shall live also. What he means is that his life starts to be lived through us. So when you're baptized, you are a baby. You're a baby. And again, Peter's going to say that you need to feed on milk. And that is the, the word of God. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. But then you grow. And he starts to live through you. Because of his resurrection, we have that resurrection life living in us. So when you go into the water when you're baptized, that's like death with Jesus. When you come up out of the water, that's like resurrection with him. But it doesn't stop there. You see, his resurrection life keeps on living through you. 
And it's a very cruel world in which we live, and it can seem that actually this is the world of no second chances. You've, you've got one crack, and if you, one crack at it, and if you fail it, that's it. If you don't build up your career, if you don't make your money, if you don't marry right, if your kids aren't wonderful, or whatever it might be, then you're sort of a failure. And it seems like there's, there's no second chances. There's no third chance, for sure, no fourth chance. As you go through life and things don't work out, you just start to slide down all the time. Whereas in Christ there is this absolute idea of a possibility, of a totally new beginning, of a rebirth, of being born again, which is a difficult idea to get your head around. That can that really be? Can it really be that I, who have been the I'll say the victim of circumstance, I who am the product of all the circumstances and processes and relationships that I had that have left me like I am as a personality. Let's say you've been in, in say, three or four serious relationships in the course of your life, come the middle age. And definitely, you, you have those experiences formed you as a person. And you were formed by experiences as a child uh, and so forth. But you have got the absolute chance or opportunity, I would say, to be born again, to start again, and to have these, this bigger influence of God's Spirit upon you. So he says that we've been born again, I'd say through baptism and through the work of the Spirit, to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, his resurrection, his new life, comes through into us to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you so that eternity that we are going to experience when Jesus comes back is being developed now and when Jesus comes then he will give it to us as Peter is going to go on to say when the chief shepherd that's Jesus shall appear then we also shall appear with him in glory Revelation, some of the last words of the Lord Jesus are, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man as his work shall be. So the reward, as it were, is being prepared for us, but you don't get it in this life, nor when you die, but when Jesus comes back, when we shall be resurrected, and come the day of judgment, and we shall be changed. So, that eternity, that future reward nature that we have will not fade away in all human experiences there is a sort of a drop off oh if only I had that house, if only I had that car, if only I had that job, if only I had that money if only I had that man, that woman that family, it would be wonderful, but it's all I'm looking for the end of the rainbow and even if you get to that point if only I had that house if only I had that income let's say you get it in the end it still fades away it, all that you might do in life to try to get what you would so love even if you get it and most people live and die without getting what they dream of getting but even if you got your dream it will still fade away that is the thing Whereas this hope that is being prepared for us is eternal and does not fade away. It's even going to get better and better. And there you are at the very frontier, at the very limit of how a person can imagine what is on offer to us. That it is not simply eternal life. It is not simply infinite existence. Because before I say yes to that, I want to know what kind of existence? As I often say, if you're offering me eternal life living here in Croydon in South London, no thanks, I don't want to live a thousand years here, let alone a million years, let alone a billion years. We don't want to live as we are now. And yet we're frightened of dying. Who, who particularly wants to end it all? Well, you know, no. And so the gospel meets us, the gospel of the kingdom of God meets us exactly at our need that I don't want to die, but then I don't want to live forever like I am. Okay, you will die, but it is only asleep, because if you're connected with the resurrection of Jesus, 
the resurrection power and life of the Lord Jesus will break through into your life and you also will be resurrected and live forever. And yet not just exist forever, but this inheritance, this undefiled, incorruptible, that does not fade away. There will be no fading, no fade to grey, no, no sort of boredom factor in the existence that we will have with God and with Jesus. You, verse 5, who by the power of God are guarded or kept through faith to a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is what I'm saying. That your salvation ultimately is given in the last day. And that is the day when Jesus comes back to the earth and one day these cloudy skies will open and the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, will come back in glory with his angels, will come to Mount Zion in Jerusalem and we who are in Christ shall be resurrected. Right? That salvation will be given to us in the last time, in the last day. But he says, by the power, by the Spirit of God, we are kept through our faith until that happens. So God is going to keep you in the path. He's going to keep you on the track that leads to that eternity. Now that's hard to believe when life keeps going wrong. Now the fact is that all the stuff that goes wrong, be it socially, be it financially, be it in relationships, be it in your health, all of that is somehow part of this longer, wider, longer term plan that God has to save you, to give you in the last day when Jesus comes back, that unfading, never to be corrupted, wonderful eternity. Wherein he says, verse 6, in that hope you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've suffered many trials. So he, he says that all our suffering is for a little while, and that is a big theme in the Bible, that Paul, for example, talks about our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But you think, well, how, how is it that my life is just a short time? Very, all very well, Peter's saying that all your trials and sufferings are only for a short time. You see, if you have no perspective of eternity, you say, well, what have I got? 70 years, 80 years, 90 years if I'm really unlucky, coughing and hacking my way to the end, losing your marbles. That's a very short time. And, oh, well, I've just lost my legs. I've lost my arms. I've lost my family. I've lost what I had. Oh dear, you know, and I've got to live like that for the rest of my life. That's terrible. That's a death sentence. And yes, it is, if you have only got the perspective of this life. But if you are in Christ and you are secure in him and you are absolutely sure that I am going to live forever to the point that you can believe what Jesus said when he said that I give you now eternal life. I know we're going to die, but that is just a hiccup. That is just a, a sleep. If you've got that perspective, then this life, be it 70, 80 years, is just, is just a little moment. It is just not even a millimeter in the context of that eternal long, 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 long line that's got no end. The infinity of eternity that is in front of us then this life is only but a moment. It's just a millimetre. But if you haven't got that hope, then sure, every moment now really drags. Every moment drags. And yeah, if things go wrong and you go down in life, and we're all going to go down in the end to the grave, then, oh, that's a tragedy. I want to get maximum enjoyment for as long as I can in this life. That, that's a story, isn't it? I want to have in every part of my life this maximum high level of enjoyment. But it doesn't work out. <laughs> you've got to work. You've got to exist. You've got to cope with health problems and so forth. And there's, all of us have got other people in our lives that drag you down one way or another. So you don't get there. But that's fine. If you've got that perspective of eternity that I'm just passing through for a moment, as he begins by saying, you are just strangers. Your, your foreigners that are just passing through. Your foreigners who are just in exile. This isn't your home. You're just passing through. And that's it. 
And so he says, verse 7, so that the proof of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is proved by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, the emphasis is on the revelation of Jesus. It is on the second coming of Jesus to the earth, as he promised. He ascends to heaven, and the angels say, you know, this same Jesus, whom you have seen ascend into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him ascend. And so he, he says, but for now, your faith is being tested like gold going through the fire. Well, if you find gold, you don't find a bright, shiny, yellow stone lying around in the, in the ground. You find this dirty uh, nugget that is dirty. And that has got to be put into intense, intense heat so that all the, the dirt, the dross, falls off it and it becomes yellow, the, the, the colour of gold that we're used to. But that's not how it starts. It starts as the dirty nugget that has got to be put into the flame. And so it is with us that <clears throat> this is how we begin. We begin dirty. And you've got to go through the flame of trials. But all the testing, all the nasty stuff, all the heat that you take in life, for us it's got a purpose. This is the tragedy for, for the unbeliever that all the suffering they have, the trials, because everybody has it, uh, achieves nothing. What did it achieve if, let's say, you lose your legs? Let's say you lose your arms. So what, what does that achieve? Oh, it just gave me a load of frustration and disappointment and, and I lost my mates and all the rest of it. I can't do this anymore. I can't do that anymore. Yeah. But <clears throat> for us, for believers, you think, well, okay, so that's what I've been given. To, that's the fire that I'm going through to prepare me to bring me out as gold. You know, Job says this in the Old Testament. When he loses everything, he loses his kids, they're killed. He loses his wealth, he loses everything, loses his health. And he says to God, when you have finished trying me, testing me, I will come forth as gold. And if we do that, he, he says we will be praised when Jesus comes back. A strange idea. But yes, when Jesus comes back and he sees those of us who've gone through all this and responded to it and had the dirt sort of burnt out of us, he will praise us. Well done. How can that be? In the parable, the Lord Jesus says that when he comes, he will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, me? Well done from Jesus, the perfect son of God telling me, oh, well done. How come? And he will say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And we will say, but when did I do that? I didn't do it, Lord. You talked to the wrong guy. No, you. So he's keeping a record, if you like, of all the things that he wants to praise us for. And especially what he'll praise us for is actually holding on. Holding on. I'd like to pass the... Um, put a mic now. What he'll praise us for is holding on. It seems so inappropriate. I don't want to be praised by Jesus. I, I, I just want to live forever. I just want to be with him. But he says that, no, it says here that we will be praised if the trials bring forth the gold. And so what that means, thank you, what that means is that there is meaning to all our trials. There is meaning to it all. And, you know, we're here to take the bread and the juice in memory of the Lord Jesus. And you see that above all in his life. You look at the pain of the crucifixion, physical pain, mental pain, that this was done to him by his, by his own people. He was the king of the Jews, but he was crucified by the Jews. He was lied about. He was abused. The people whom he had healed, who he'd done so much good for, you know, they turned around and said, we have no king but Caesar. And yet you see the huge good that came out of evil. And this is one of the huge themes of the Bible. We see it back with Joseph. We looked at him a couple of months ago, where he says, you meant it for evil, but God worked it for good. And as I say, if you don't have the perspective of God's kingdom in front of you and the knowledge of God's working in your life right now, Life is tragic. 
that it's just a load of grief, a load of pain, and there's no gain out of that pain. Whereas you get in with what Peter's saying, that you've been born again, as he says, you've got a living hope, you've been baptized, you believe that you're going to live forever at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as he says, when Jesus comes, you be in God's kingdom, live there forever. All the suffering that we're going through, yes, that makes sense, that's logical, is it not? That, of course, there has to be the cross before the crown. It's not all, you, know, you, you can't have it just with one way, that, oh yeah, it's all pure blessing, like you know, some churches will tell you, that oh, you know, you, you're going to get amazingly blessed now, plus you've got blessing in the future. No, 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 it's quite different here. He's putting it absolutely the other way around, that life is an intense fire that is changing you from the dirty nugget into the beautiful gold. So, you see it above all in the Lord Jesus, that through suffering, through enduring, enduring the cross, despising the shame, only after that was he set down at the right hand of God in glory. So, let's give thanks for him enabling all this for us, as we began by saying, it is because of his resurrection, and therefore because of his death, that we can live also, that we have that living hope, that we have his life living in and through us. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you in, in very small little human words for the wonder and the beauty of your purpose with us. And we pray, Father, that every one of us here gather together here in this little place in South London, that we, we, Father, that we might be your people, that we might be those truly for whom the Lord Jesus died in order to save us, that we might respond to the, the heat of our lives, the heat of trial, the heat of all that's going on, and that we might be and respond to it all as you would have us, so that we might live forever in that wonderful environment that will be an inheritance that does never fade away. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making that possible. And we salute you, Lord Jesus, for your foresight and for your endurance when we were yet sinners to do this for us and to make it possible. Amen.